Welcome to my channel. My name is Burcu Öztürk. Today I want to talk about the analysis of EBITDA and financial statements. So most of you have been going through analysis of financial performance, the historic numbers, year over years, etc. Uh, either as a potential investor or as a business owner or as a banker. Uh, and I walk you through a real-time example together and to let you know uh, how, how many questions I ask and what type of questions I ask throughout my analysis and we will walk through an EBITDA analysis and adjust the EBITDA numbers to its uh, sustainable base performance so uh, the numbers are never uh, the same as given to you or reported to you that's why we will be walking with you through the numbers, the reported numbers, and you will see how I adjust the numbers to make sure that the EBITDA is on its sustainable level. So now let's start with uh, one real-time example. And I'm a potential investor into a retail company called Company ABC. And I just received the financial information and I'm looking through the financial performance of 2018 and 2019. So I have a couple of questions in my mind and I'll walk you through each line item in the profit and loss statements, the PL statements. And we will ask questions and I have no information background into the company and we will walk you through together. Uh, I want you to see what type of questions I ask when I'm looking at the numbers. So I have the numbers in front of me, by the way, that's why I'm looking uh, all together with you. So if you look at the revenue performance on company ABC, it looks like a great success is achieved in 2019 because revenues doubled up. From $500,000 to $1 million revenue is a great success. So I need to ask a couple of questions to the management. What are the drivers of the revenue growth? And is it volume growth? Did you make more sales? Or did you increase your unit prices? Or did you increase uh, your customer base? Like, did you make any special project with a customer? So those are the questions in my mind. So once we look into the cost details, uh, I'm looking at cost in three ways because there are three types of costs while you're analyzing the financial statements. One of them is the fixed cost base. It's fixed because it's not linked to any revenue growth. Uh, the most basic example to this um, fixed cost basis is rent costs. Usually the stores, if they make more revenues, they pay the uh, same amount of rent or the, if they are making no revenues, uh, they are still making the same amount of rent payment. So those types of costs that are not dependent on any volume growth or sales growth is called fixed costs. And if you have a variable cost, variable cost is fully dependent on the revenue growth. For example, number of shoes sold. If you make more number of shoes sales, then your material cost could go up. That's the basic or natural um, conclusion or um, so conclusion to that. So uh, those are the variable costs. Semi-fixed cost is in between. I always give the example of personal cost. For example, you may make more sales on that month. That doesn't mean that you need to increase your whole personal cost base or headcount then your personal cost is semi-linked to revenue growth. It's not growing fully dependent on revenue growth, but in any case, it gets some relation to the revenue growth. So it's in between called semi-fixed cost. So we need to understand while uh, making an analysis of cost details, we need to understand the drivers and types of costs uh, while doing a, a right analysis in the cost side. So revenues, remember, revenues increased by 100%. It was a great success in hand. Uh, once I look at the material cost, material cost only increased by 50%. So that's interesting. That needs to be digged into because I would expect the uh, retail company to have a higher material cost increase because revenues doubled up. So that's one thing that I will be asking to the management. And the second piece is personal cost. 
that's another interesting trend in the personal cost uh, okay revenues doubled up that's why personal cost could naturally go up but it increased by 200 percent that's again a weird trend uh, i would expect to go at most 100 percent but this time it's like they paid all the revenue growth to the personnel so we need to understand that as well and talk to the management and if you look at the rent cost, rent cost by, increased by 30%. Uh, so they either rented a new store or the landlord increased the rent base of the uh, existing store. So I need to understand the basis of rent as well. And if you look at the uh, other expenses, it increased by around 35%. Other expenses usually include various different types of expenses some of them are fixed some of them are semi-fixed or fully variable costs so I need to get into the details of that why because uh, revenues jumped up by 100% but other expenses only increased by 35% so I'm ready with my questions to the management and what did the management ask from me as a potential investor uh, I was asked to pay an amount uh, corresponding to the value of the company, which is a multiple of EBITDA. If you watch my previous video, I walk you through EBITDA and the definition of EBITDA. If you haven't watched, I highly recommend you to watch my uh, previous video because it shows you uh, the meaning of EBITDA and the framework, uh, framework of EBITDA throughout the finance terminology. And they ask me a multiple of EBITDA. Let's say it's 10 times EBITDA of 2019. And obviously 2019 was a great year uh, from a financial standpoint for company ABC. So I need to calculate the EBITDA on my own because I just received the net income statements. As I said in the previous video, EBITDA calculation is very, very easy to make. So don't be afraid of it or don't think that it's very terminologic. So what we do is we add back interest, amortization and taxation back to uh, net income numbers. So once we add those numbers back to uh, net income number, we receive or we calculate the operational uh, performance of the company, which is called EBITDA. By definition, it is earnings before interest, taxation, depreciation and amortization. So six things. Uh, you also watched it in my previous video as well. So we eliminated uh, the amortization, interest and taxation from net income and we come up with the operational performance of the company. And once we do the calculation, it looks like this company again did a great job in terms of EBITDA production. Because in 2018, the EBITDA number was only $200,000. Whereas if you look at 2019, it made $500,000 worth of EBITDA. It's like 150% growth. So it, the numbers are phenomenal and looks very good on the paper. So as a potential investor, I need to ask how did they achieve this success? That's the whole idea of management meeting. And that's the whole idea of understanding the real cash generation capacity of the company. So now I have a management meeting. The first question I ask is, okay, uh, you did a great job in terms of revenue production capacity. Can you tell me how did you achieve this revenue growth capacity within one year only? So what I was told was that they did a company ABC did a special project for a new entrance to the market and from that project it's a special consultancy project that they uh, did in 2019 and throughout that project they received $400,000 of revenues and so the second question I should be asking is that can you do such projects in the future and should I assume that revenue is going to be continuing in the future? The answer is unfortunately no. So it's the one time revenue in my 2019 performance. Although it's good for the company because it's not sustainable or it's not going to be continuing in the future, 
I need to adjust that as an investor in my valuation of the company. So that's the first piece. One time revenues from a special customer. That's not going to continue in the future. And secondly, we were discussing around the material costs because revenues went up by 100%, but material costs only increased by 50%. So what's the deal? Is there an efficiency project? Did the prices go down in my unit uh, price purchases, etc., etc.? And we were discussing around the decline in the material costs in 2019, and management just realized that the accountant forgot to record some of the material costs. Uh, so don't laugh at me, but that happens a lot of times. Uh, I used to do due diligence and such studies many, many times for about 10 years. And even the big companies sometimes do that error or it's sometimes not an error, but misstatement. But in any case, sometimes there are unrecorded costs into the PL. And so this management realized that they forgot to record some of the material costs. Normally, there is no change into the material cost trend from 2018 to 19, so there should be no decline. So that's the second piece. So the material cost could go, should go up, revenue needs to go down. Those are the two items that I learned from the management. And thirdly, we were talking about the personnel cost. Remember, we looked at the numbers and there was 200% increase into the numbers and personnel costs really jumped up and I guess the personnel should be really happy that they got a better compensation package in 2019. But that's not the case. Uh, there was one uh, long-term employee of the company who retired and he or she had a special package and that's why the company had to make a huge compensation payment to one employee only in 2019. So what I learned is the personal cost didn't go up as much as I saw on the PL, but there was one time payment. So, in the future, personal cost is expected to go down in 2020 and onwards in comparison to 2019. So, 2019, that huge growth was a one time growth. So, I need to adjust again the EBITDA number by that one-time cost. I need to deduct that one-time cost from my p &L. So one downward adjustment to EBITDA coming from uh, one-time revenues, another downward adjustment from uh, to EBITDA coming from unrecorded material costs, but an upward trend uh, EBITDA adjustment uh, coming from the one-time personnel payments. So now let's look at the numbers once we adjust the EBITDA for those adjustments. So if you look at the numbers, the EBITDA, the reported EBITDA, remember it went up from $200,000 to $500,000. There was a big jump into EBITDA and the company owner was asking me as a potential owner or investor a big amount of money due to that great success. But if I look at the adjusted EBITDA numbers for those three uh, special cases, the EBITDA number actually went down from $200,000 to $100,000. There was almost 50% decline in the EBITDA performance of the company. So I need to discuss that with the company owner, saying that what you show me as a, a good or great performance on the financial statements is not sustainable. And in the future, there is a declining trend in this company and we need to discuss that. Maybe I will become a potential investor or I will not become an investor to this company. But all in all, whatever is reported to us in summary, uh, whatever report is reported to us in terms of income statement or EBITDA analysis, we need to really challenge the key drivers of the changes in those numbers and understand the sustainable base of EBITDA in that company, then we will find the right value of the company. So today we walked through how to analyze the financial statements and EBITDA performance of the company and how to adjust the EBITDA numbers throughout those facts that we learned. And uh, so if you're a first time watcher, please do not uh, forget to subscribe to my channel and I hope you found it useful. 
thank you.